Welcome to the round 18 Super Coach Coach podcast. We are right into the home stretch, six rounds to go. I'm Marcus, and this week we're joined again by Faz, back to back episodes. Welcome back, mate. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. And we've got Bryce back with us as well. Welcome back, Bryce. Good to be back. Keen to bring some energy to the show. Let's uh, let's get into it. <laughs> some gusto for Hamish and Andy fans out there. All right. Why don't you kick us off, Bryce, in terms of how your weekend went uh, and I guess how you've gone since the last time you've been on the show as well. Try to keep the uh, energy up as, as much as I can. It's been a bit <laughs> flat uh, and so has my rank improvement or not. Been middling around the three or four K for a number of weeks and in around the buys. Didn't really make much improvement. Uh, this week went up from 37.44 to 36.44, so up 100 spots, better to go up than down. But it was kind of the week that could have been held back by having Devin Robinson on the field. And I won't bore you with the, the background of how that eventuated. I had four trade options to, to go with, but that's the way it is. Uh, sometimes when you go away for, for a week, forget about Supercoach, forget about work, uh, you just come back and look at your team and go, okay, I'll just roll with this team again. So had my time again, probably would have bought in Dugowie, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, so my score for the week was 25-34. I've got three trades left to uh, to work with, uh, one spot on field to upgrade. Probably going to look to do that this week with Dev Robinson. Pretty similar score for me this week, Bryce. It was 25-44, so I think about 10 points difference there between the two of us. Surprising that uh, a score of that nature is just sort of an okay score, but Mm. a sign of the stage of the season that we're up to. The disappointing scores were probably Whitfield with his concussion and the 32 there. But for me, it was uh, a bit of a blunder uh, after having Bramble as an emergency with a 120 had the option to loop him on field instead of Taranto, but I was scared that Finn McRae would be the sub. So I was waiting until the last minute and ended up missing lockout there as I was trying to check if Finn McRae was playing in the VFL, which he was. So I would have been safe to, to go ahead and get Bramble. And I thought after you know, halfway through the first quarter, Taranto was on 17 points. I'm going to win this one out anyway. And then Taranto goes on to 64. Yeah, Oof. so... 50-odd points there that, that were left on the pine with Bramble. Very keen to chat to you boys both this week with Whitfield and Langford in my side. There's a couple of uh, potential decisions to be made. So you know, I'm sure we'll get into both those topics in a minute. Yeah, you're both disappointed, but you both beat me. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Bryce, by the slimmest of margins, uh, three points more than me. So 25-31. Uh, was looking really good with Petrarca's 173 as well. But I had Whitfield 32, Sidebottom 57, Hawkins 70, and Dusty Martin 74. So all those poor scores really dragged down the team. And Sidebottom two weeks in a row looking mm. absolutely deplorable. Uh, some concerns there. But uh, finished Grundy from Flynn. So that felt really, really good to have Grundy back in the team as the captain as well, which was nice. Big last quarter there. This week, I'm looking at maybe Rowan Marshall for Danaher. But yeah, like you said, Faz, this week, main topics for the week are going to be discussing what we do with uh, Lockie Whitfield, what we do with Kyle Langford, uh, and a, a bit of a look to people who are looking for their final upgrades or, or final side swaps as well. Before we get going into the questions for the week, though, I'm going to just do a quick recap of our groups. Uh, so our top scorer in our Patreon group at the moment at 185th overall is Travis's team styling and profiling. So took the lead uh, across the weekend and is now our overall leader for our Patreon group and the front runner for that cash prize at the moment. So a huge score there. Top score for the Patreon group for the round was 2684. So Simon's team, Goods United. And in our Super Coach Coach group, our leader remains Clem's team, the Beardy Man Buns. He is okay. obviously at first overall. 2493 was his score for round 17, and he's hung on to that 
Uh, we should also mention that number two overall, uh, she hasn't joined our Super Coach Coach group for the year, but um, she has been a long time listener, is uh, Emily Chalice. She's coming second at the moment. So it's pretty cool to see number one and number two as, as both people we know from the Super Coach Coach community. And we'll keep our eyes peeled for what is an exciting contest on the run home. In terms of our overall top scorer for our Super Coach Coach public group, that was Josh's team, Dangerous Fields with 2745, which was a top 50 round rank uh, in our main super coach coach group. So shout out to all those people in the community. I know we spent a bit more time at this stage of the season doing shout outs, but uh, you know, lots of exciting movement up the top to keep track of there. So hopefully that's not boring too many people. And uh, with that, we'll move on to questions of the week. So this week we'll start off with a question from at Babylon. 9268 on Twitter. Four trades left, 100K in bank. Would you trade to Callum Mills even with either Bianco or Tom Highmore as cover? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it seems like four trades left, 100 in bank. Does he need to use two trades to get to Mills or just the one? It sounds like, is it a Whitfield replacement? It sounds like it could be. I mean, that uh, might be assumed. But, yeah, I guess assume that's a, the scenario. He can put 100K on Whitfield and get Mills. That gives him three trades remaining for the run home. And with Bianco and Highmore as cover, I mean, that seems like a great situation to be in. I would be fairly comfortable going down to two trades at this point with six weeks left. Obviously, three is even better. Whitfield's going to be out for one week, and it's on the border of being two weeks but as far as a trading strategy goes, I think two is the line that you want to be at to feel comfortable for the next six weeks. Three would be great. And I think one is on the edge. So for me, getting that potential stinker of a rookie score off the field and going down to one trade is probably something that I'm going to be taking the risk on this week. Dev Robinson's lost cash. It's going to have to be a 350K type compromise option or I can get a high-end option and go down to one trade. So I'm probably going to go to that and make sure I have the cover. I guess the other consideration for my trade situation was with that premium, if you go one up, one down, the one up is the premium, but then getting in the right down option at this point it can be really critical and it's either a player that's going to give you future cover and scoring or it's a dpp flexibility and being able to move players around to get those playing players and and cover in the right parts of the field to give you cover for the rest of the season so last week i wasn't sure what, what is that player that is going to give me scoring cover or flexibility to move players around and I, I couldn't make that decision on the second player, which is why I didn't trade last week. Um, so I'm considering what what is that second player that I'm going to select myself. And it could be a player like Durham, who, who might play in the end and has that mid-def flexibility. It might be someone like a minivan or what's the Collingwood player? P- people are calling him minivan. But uh, yeah, that uh, Collingwood rookie, 102K forward mid who might play in the future, might be low scoring, but you can move them around with other players. So that's what I'm looking at and concentrating on this week. What is the best rookie to pair with that premium player to go one up, one down? And sorry, that was a a bit of a long answer around trading strategy. But yeah, what do you think about all that? I I would be looking at doing everything you can to get the top level premium into your side. So if it's a Mills, like was mentioned in this question of, you know, in your scenario, if you're looking for the Fords, getting up to those, if you can get Dangerfield into your side, you know, Zorko, I'm guessing is probably a bridge too far at, at his current price, but getting the rolled gold premiums in just you know, mitigates the, the risk. We'll move on to the next question from David Bailey from Facebook. What do we do with Lockie Whitfield? Hold and use Highmore as cover. Use one trade, go somebody cheaper. Use two trades downgrade CCJ to a forward and upgrade Whitfield to Mills and allow for dollars for remaining injury trades or late luxury upgrades. In general, like, would you consider just holding Whitfield? Is it a certainty that Whitfield to, to Mills would be uh, a big points increase? You know, what sort of trade count 
would you force a certain level of conservatism around not playing too much with these sort of side swaps considering it's a concussion so he, he should really only miss one week what would you be putting on field this week if you're holding on to Whitfield if it's a, a high more that's probably only sort of 30 odd points you're losing out if he covers more of the Bianco type then that could be 70 odd points with the way that Bianco's scoring has sort of tailed off and there's even been a bit of talk of him maybe needing a rest this week in in my circumstance, I'm probably being sucked in a bit with last week's points, but I can flip Laird into the back line and then put Bramble on field. So I'm pretty tempted to to run with that option rather than trade Whitfield. It would see me still holding onto three trades moving into five weeks to go, but it, that doesn't feel like getting to the point of too many trades just yet that I need to be looking for opportunities to trade. I, I feel like I can utilize the cover while I have it and then still have some trades up my sleeve for if things really go awry in the last few weeks. Uh, I think using Highmar for one week uh, is a a pretty reasonable approach. It would only be if it ends up being two weeks out. I know that it could be right on the border from what's been said and maybe this will come out in the next few days, but it's like 12 days from when it happens, uh, as in when it's diagnosed so we're not sure where that ends, whether that ends on the Saturday or the Friday. If it was two weeks, I think that there would be some consideration whether trading is a good approach and how well he comes back from concussion. If you're in the running up the top and you don't have cover, then it's probably something you'll be forced into trading. If you had Highmore as cover, I think it's pretty straightforward to hold for the one week. Uh, when it gets to two weeks and you don't have cover, I think is where you start thinking about uh, what your options are for trading. I think, yeah, Faz, you're in a good situation with Laird being able to flip him around into the back line and get him to cover there and have someone like Bramble or one of your mid-forward DPPs come in and maybe loophole. I have Laird in the midfield as well, so that's something that I'll be doing and holding Whitfield. I don't have the trades to do anything else anyway. But, yeah, some people might be in more luxurious trade scenarios. What about you, Marcus? You have Whitfield? Uh, yeah, I've got Whitfield. With my sort of trade count, if I had Whitfield in the back line and Laird in the mids, uh, I'd be pretty tempted to use this opportunity to swap Whitfield to Steele or Bontempelli or something like that. could deliver a fairly significant point gain on the run home, just premium for premium, and then you add the, the, the rookie cover this week differential, and, and that should potentially get you close to 150, 200 points. I think 150 is probably closer to the bar that you want to clear at this stage of the season. Traditionally, I think it's 200 points for an upgrade, but uh, the trades are worth less the, the further you get into this the season, unless you there's freak injuries that cause a lot of chaos. So I certainly think that's something to consider for people who have led in the midfield. Uh, Whitfield to a, a primo mid seems great. But otherwise, yeah, I think the big consideration with covering Whitfield is do you have high more? And it also depends on your upgrade option. So I have a lot of the top scoring options, the only ones left to take a risk on, I think, are Ryan and Rich, who have some injury concerns. Whitfield could outscore them on the run home. So it seems probably foolish, even though I've got a lot of trades, to side swap for just the one week. If he was missing two, I'd almost certainly do it in my trade scenario. But I've got six trades, and I'm thinking of potentially holding him. I don't have Highmore for cover, but I have Bianco Durham and Briggs Madden. So I, I figure I should be able to use some sort of loopholing to, to get a half reasonable score on field somehow and just cop it that way. There's a combination of things. Not having Mills is, is definitely tempting. But then again, you know, Whitfield can average 110 on the run home too with the final five rounds. So it's a, a much tougher question than, you know, if we were dealing with a side bottom or a, there are many more fringe premiums than Whitfield, unfortunately. But I think the decision is going to be quite team specific. On to the next question from Robert Hughes, one of our patrons. He's got six trades left and he has both Whitfield and Langford. So in your situation, Faz, are there any good side swaps or downgrades? Do you know what the status is with Langford, Faz? Some tightness. and yeah, Something came out today Something oh, okay. out from uh, the head of high performance. I think Honeyball posted it. Langford presented hamstring tightness throughout the game. Unfortunately, has sustained a hamstring strain. We'll hopefully get him back in a few weeks. So that sounds more likely to be 
two to three rather than one. That's a pretty tempting trade. Missing three of the next six rounds is half of the games remaining. Yes, I think that's that's going to force my hand. Um, got the cover this week, but it's uh, the two Brisbane boys actually with Fullerton and Madden, who I wouldn't say either have sort of great job security. Leicester's back from his injury, so Madden could be on some thin ice in terms of his job security. Uh, and Fullerton hasn't played since you know, round four or whatever it was when McStay came back into the side. So Hipwood's injury aside, I think you know, neither of those I'd be confident in holding their spots long term. The good thing trade. is he scored 98, so his price That's stayed true. pretty healthy. At 468K, if you have just 11K in bank, you can afford Nick Hind, Jake Stringer, Bailey Dow, Dusty Martin. All above his price tag. Mm, plus Tom Hawkins, yep. Ron Marshall, Toby Green, lots of reasonable Plenty options. Of options. So in terms of ranking the options, how would you go in terms of a top three price in and around, let's call Nick Hine the top of that boundary? Mm-hmm. So I guess when I'm considering these options, I'm probably thinking about how many trades I have remaining, therefore maybe avoiding some options which are more injury prone and might need a a force trade in a few weeks. Um, That said, six weeks might be okay to get through. I will probably be looking at something similar in my Dev Robertson situation, so I'd be keen to hear on your rankings. If you want the kind of safe 90-95 get through the season, should be relatively injury free. It's probably someone like Bailey Dale or Nick Hind I like as uh, options. What were the other ones that you mentioned, Marcus? Jake Stringer. Nope. Jordan Dugowie. Dusty Martin. Toby Green. Tom Hawkins. Ron Marshall. I think those are probably the standouts. Mm. Uh, Shy Bolton, 422K. You're a former owner. Uh, still an owner. Oh, still uh, an owner. Oh, held him yeah. through. He's been a bit frustrated in the last couple of weeks. I probably wouldn't be trading him in. I feel like there's some issues there. Low time on ground, some kind of injury. He could be okay, but Richmond have been a bit poo the last uh, few weeks, so probably not someone I'd be looking to bring in. Tom Hawkins has been up and down, but is generally pretty good with injuries. He might be one if you like a key forward, but yeah, I probably prefer the safer, steady scoring options. Um, if you wanted to take a risk, Ron Marshall could appeal. Has that upside, 100 plus scoring potential, but it depends on the trade situation. If you're low on trades and uh, would really hurt if he got injured, then probably look for one of the safer options. So ranking wise, probably put Dale up the top. I can't split the others that much. Uh, let's say Hawkins in Marshall. Yeah, I do like that. I think Dale and Hind probably more close than I would give Hind credit for or have given him credit for, but I'm personally not looking at him a heap. I probably have pretty similar rankings. I think Dale is the safest. I'd probably go Hawkins next because I think he's got the highest upside. Geelong have a good run home. And then Rowan Marshall's only third because of uh, potential for injury. But at that price tag, he's arguably the most attractive of the three based on price for potential. So uh, my problem here is that I think I agree with the rankings. I've got Hind and, and Dale up the top. My problem is I've only got 6K in bank. Uh, I just miss out on both of those, uh, and I've already got Dusty, so I've pretty much got to look below uh, Langford's price. So my decision, I think, for the rest of the week will be weighing up Hawkins versus Ron Marshall. You know, that, that's a decision I'll have to make is whether I sort of want a, a more up-and-down scorer with better injury history or I'd say Marshall probably has a bit of a higher upside just given he plays in the ruck, but pretty clear injury risk there. So... Given my form form and history, I'll probably take the safe option and then Hawkins will go down with an injury. Let's go to the next question uh, about steel side bottom. This is from Chris Slater on Facebook. Is side bottom's poor scoring form or role related? Is the new coach hurting him? So uh, I think we flagged this last week and didn't recommend people trade him. Obviously, his break even's high, but on an ongoing basis, uh, even as a value selection, he presents a whole heap of risk. I think the coach could be one element, but for me, the the biggest reason for his drop-off is Pendle's recovery from that finger injury that was undisclosed for a little while. A move back into the midfield, which saw Pendlebury's score spike back up. 
and Sidebottom was always starting to get relegated more toward the forward line, uh, hence his mid-forward position last year. Uh, he became a better option with uh, getting that time back in the midfield. Didn't realise that was because of Pendlebury being injured. Now that Pendlebury's back in the midfield, I think if they're going to pick one old guy to play the midfield, it's Pendlebury and not mm. side bottom. I'm certainly concerned about having him on an ongoing basis. Uh, he'd be somebody that if you can trade him out, probably wouldn't be the worst idea. There's a good chance he averages 80 for the run home rather than 100. And uh, that means you could probably get pretty decent bang for your buck if you upgrade him to, you know, a danger field type. Trying to look at the numbers there, um, looking at CBA attendances over the uh, over the season, and you see that just what you said, Marcus. And this will be out with my analysis tomorrow with how it's gone green through that middle part of the season, where it's up at 88, 75, 63 percent. CBAs around the time that Pendlebury was out of the midfield and now it's dropped um, since the buys he's gone three games 0% 14% 7% and I guess they're trying new guys in there young guys I've got Dugowie and Pendles is back in there so it doesn't look like it that's going to change anytime soon so rolls not very good he seems to be butchering the ball a lot yeah I'd be pretty worried as an owner and certainly wouldn't be targeting him as a cheap upgrade uh, at this point Taylor Adams probably just the only other name I'd throw in there that I think he, he came back three weeks ago as well. So that's probably mm. another, it's certainly not feed. helping the, the case for the steel side bottom. All right. Next question from Andrew Bailey. Thoughts on Sean Darcy as a POD. Gorn has been struggling for form race recently and he still uh, has one final rock position wow. as his final upgrade. Very interesting. He's been the top scorer in Supercoach two rounds in a row now. And a lot of us had the option to bring our final ruck in with trading Grundy out. So I know there's a lot of FOMO out there. Uh, it seems very obvious in hindsight. I'm like, why did I pick Gorn? What, what do you gents reckon? I think that's actually a pretty decent suggestion. I, I would go Grundy ahead of Gorn. But at this stage, mm-hmm. yeah, the Gorn-Jackson scenario is not playing out very nicely. I've heard it spoken about uh, on another Supercoach forum saying – sort of enjoying the last few weeks of ever being Max Gorn owners. I don't think I'll be signing up for another season of Gorn next year unless anything dramatic changes at the top of the, the ruck landscape. And Darcy, you can't really look away from back-to-back 180s. There wouldn't be all that many players in the history of Supercoach that have ever scored at, at that extreme level. I think that Darcy really is right up there as one of the, the premier ruckmen in the game. And you know he's always had a bit of a injury issues across his history but that's the advantage of picking him for six weeks if you're in Andrew Bailey's circumstances where you just need him to get through the next six and and you're fine I'd be very tempted even if the trade was initially earmarked for a Max Gorn trade in that sort of form it's, it's hard to argue against yeah, I've been looking at the trend of Gorn and Jackson in the team as far as centre bounce attendances, and it kind of initially started with Max dominating those centre bounce attendances at around the kind of 85, 90 mark at the start of the season, with Jackson being down towards the like 10, 15%, and that's gradually been increasing across the season towards the middle around 25%, but Yeah, the average is now across the season for Jackson, 27%, with the last three weeks being about 30%. So that's a bit of a share towards Jackson that takes away Gorn's points. He doesn't seem to be as moving as well as he did maybe the last couple of years. Maybe uh, the game is catching up with him a bit, which feels wrong to say about Max Gorn. But if I had the option, then Sean Darcy's the form ruckman in the competition and doesn't have as much share in the Frio situation. They also have a pretty reasonable draw the next few weeks as far as Ruck uh, matchups. So just got through Hawthorne and have Geelong, Sydney, Richmond to come and then finish with Brisbane, West Coast, St Kilda. So the last three are a bit more difficult, but the next three are pretty good matchups for him. So um, he could continue his good form. Yeah, I think another thing to note on Gorn is that he started scoring quite a lot of points from intercept marks in the back line. And Melbourne are just winning more games. <laughs> so rather than stationing him out back, especially with Jackson in the midfield, they're putting him up forward. And 
unless you're kicking goals, you're not scoring points consistently compared to being stationed as an intercept mm. defender, essentially, which he was absolutely racking up huge amounts of points doing as well. So I think maybe that's another element that hasn't really helped toward his score. And I guess we're talking marginal differences here, right? Like he's a guy who's averaged 130, 125 previously. Now we're seeing him more maybe as a 115 type player. So it's still a very premium player. Uh, but Sean Darcy's a, what was it, 23, 24 year old Ruckman on the up and is now banging the door down. And his foil is like Tracy getting barely any ruck time. Uh, Rory Lobb as well was another guy who was brought on as a guy who gives him a bit of a chop out, but they've basically played Darcy as, as perma ruck. He's mm. that sort of role that we really like. Even with Grundy, Grundy's now playing with Cameron in the side. But when you get a very clear number one ruck that's doing 95% of the, the time in the middle or 90%, it's a recipe for some pretty big points. And and Darcy athletically is, is very gifted as well. So I think you've got... Grundy, Tim English, and then he's probably the next one in terms of the age and, and the upside potential to get excited about as, as a young ruckman. So no problems with taking that risk on the run home. I'd still pick Grundy ahead mm. of Darcy at this stage, though. Let's finish up with a captain's corner to wrap up the show. Gents, have you had a look at your captaincy at all, and uh, who might you be gelling with at this stage? Very early in the week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sean Darcy, obviously, if you have him. <laughs> Got to give him the, the the VC against Geelong. First game up, if you do have him. I think Jack Steele and Tuke Miller, I'd say, in terms of consistency, have also got to be right up there. Bont have seemed to have a couple of quieter ones after averaging like 130, 140 multiple weeks in a row. It is the first time in a few weeks that the Dogs have played Anytime other than a Sunday, I think. It, it seems like the last few weeks, your captain backup has been McRae Bond. So pretty nice to have an opportunity now to see them. First of all, Grundy plays on Sunday as well this week. So that to me looks like a pretty safe backup. Also, as you said, hard to look past Jack Steele at the moment with the form that he's in. Has just been ultra consistent and served me well last week. So it's going to be hard to, to take the V off him, I think. McRae against Gold Coast is definitely worth a shout out. His last three against Gold Coast, after I say these numbers, you both might be going with him. 169, 139, 189. Wow. So uh, he certainly looks really good there. Those are some Sean Darcy numbers right there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The other option that stands out to me is, uh, I think you mentioned Grundy there against uh, Carlton, so that's a pretty good... Uh, Ruck matchup and Collingwood seem to be playing reasonably well uh, under the new coach, so he could be uh, an option. I think it's a backup option when when do Collingwood play Sunday. Yeah, so second yeah. last game of the round. Yeah, yeah. So he seems like a pretty good backup option if you want an alternate in that game. It might be Sam Walsh against the Pies. He's been really good the last number of weeks, and I've been happy. And I think that you boys are on board with the Walsh train as mm-hmm. well. Um, if you wanted something a little bit different, Kangaroos are playing Essendon, um, so you could go potentially for your your Zebo and your Halls versus the Bombers, or you could go the uh, the Parish Merritt up against the uh, the Roos in the midfield. They could be um, quite good options as well. Parish scored 152 against North Melbourne earlier this year. I like this time of year. There's lots of good options, although you still need to choose the right one. <laughs> I think, again, in terms of average against opponent, McRae really stands out, and then mm. I think it's almost trying to pick a consistent player after that. I'd, I'd almost give him a first crack. I think uh, I didn't even read out like the, those three scores that I read were from 2020, 2019, and 2018. Mm-hmm. McRae against Gold Coast this year also scored 146. So wow. 139, 146, 169, 189. We can't That's have nice. to give him first crack, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Took's winning his own ball now. So I don't know whether he's going to be uh, tagging someone like McRae and Gold Coast aren't very good. Took so. did score 140 in the earlier game they played this year. Mm-hmm. Um, He's worried about his own game rather than someone else's, which is a good thing for Supercoach. Yeah. I think if you had Parrish, then McRae into Parrish for me seems really good. Otherwise, McRae into Grundy, I really like Mm. that one as well. 
or McRae into Steel. I think all those are pretty good. But McRae first crack, I think, off those numbers. Um, I'm just going to read out the Grundy numbers uh, just before we wrap against Carlton. Last four, 135, 127, 141, and 154, with the 135 happening in an earlier game this year. All right, and with that, uh, we'll wrap up for another week. Uh, Any final thoughts from either of you gents to close out the show? Don't let emotion get into your decision-making and make sure you prepare throughout the week so that you don't make those rush calls, speaking from experience of the last uh, few weeks. (laughs) For my um, lessons from past mistakes, leave your team set up as if everything's gone right, I guess. I I was probably too worried about Finn McRae being the med sub and being stuck with him, but realistically that that probably wasn't the most likely outcome there. So set it up as if you're going to sleep in and forget about your team because that may happen happen. to you. (laughs) Yeah, and I think it's almost on exception basis. Like if he were to be the sub, then you have to pull him off the ground. If Mm. he weren't, then you don't have to do anything. Yeah, I, I go with what the expected behavior is versus guarding against the worst case scenario there. Hmm. Good advice from the both of you to wrap up the show. I don't have anything anywhere near as insightful, so I'll keep quiet and uh, just sign off for the week. Good luck, community. Make, more, make more mistakes like we do, and you'll have to <laughs> keep the energy up. Come on, let's go. Six, Six weeks, weeks to go. go. <laughs> See ya. Bye. See ya.